Today on the show, we have a voice actress. We have voice actress Abby Creighton on, who some of you might know, some of you might not, but this is a great opportunity to get to know her. So we're just going to go straight into this interview. And Abby, why don't you just introduce yourself to our audience? Hi, I'm Abby Creighton, and I'm a voiceover actress and a theater actress, and I do some film and TV. But my career has been um, predominantly with uh, using my voice, and I've done a lot of video games and some anime and uh, some animation, a lot of commercials, and many, many, many audiobooks. Um, you know, most recently I've been working on the Star Wars, Old Republic, and Uprising games, and I just uh, finished working on Doom 4 that's coming out. Okay, so we know a lot of listeners are interested about the Old Republic and Star Wars Uprising because Star Wars is Star Wars and mm -hmm. the Old Republic is awesome. But I'm going to start with a ga one of your bigger games that happened a few years before that just because – it's one of my favorite games I've ever played, and I want to get this question out before I forget to ask it okay. and I regret it. Well, I hope I know the answer, because... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, this is about Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, uh -huh. a game you know, which was made by a studio that basically imploded afterward. It was a yeah. yeah, big debt, and Kurt Schilling got... It, it, it was a big mess, mm -hmm. but we're not going to talk about that mess exactly. Mm -hmm. But you played the voice of Alan Shear mm -hmm. in that game, who's... Uh, the female protagonist ish. Yes, yes, she's an elf and a female. She's sort of a mysterious character, I think, in the game. And uh, you know, she's uh, an assassin, and you know, we 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 learned some details about her and so on. But I'm just wondering, the way this game ends, it leaves it off on such a big open note that I just want to know: Did they ever give you any ideas or? maybe some thoughts of where they wanted to go after this, if there was any thought about that, and what would they would do with the character of Alan Shear, who's left so open at the end. You know, they didn't. And a lot of times you sign disclosure agreements that you can't talk about the game. They give you su such little information because they don't want anything leaked out. So often we're left in the dark, what the story is, what's coming next. So I think the actors a lot of the times get very little information about the game in general. So I, I had a feeling there was a, a desire for a second game, but I think that was before the implosion of the company. So maybe it just kind of got caught um, with that happening and then not being able to, to create the second one. I don't know. But, um, you know, we, we come in and do our jobs and we sign off and we, we sort of don't know a lot of what's going on around us in terms of the whole, the whole project. I don't know if you guys know that, but... Yeah. yeah. I, I've, I've got... I've got got some of those details. So when it came to actually this character, though, mm -hmm. who is pretty secretive in the game, you really don't know much until really the final act where you finally get to actually know a bunch of details about her beyond her being a rather scandalous ambassador who doesn't wear anything, really. Right. Um, <laughs> what details were you given to be able to create a voice for this character? How was the voice of this elf ambassador, or uh, mm. Dogglefar ambassador, I guess they have to really call it, um, Evolve, how, did, how did that evolve from you, and what details did it give you to be able to play this character? You know, I think that when you're working with a director, every line has a direction in it. And I think that if I, it was a couple of years ago, if I remember correctly, um, it was, you know, you really follow the track of how it's written. It's just like anything else. You know, they give you the intention of how they want it to sound, and then it, it sort of forms as you go. I think that my natural um, tendencies or intuition with characters you know, it was, it was kind of right on with her. It wasn't any kind of a stretch. Um, the British accent is always like one sort of added thing that I have to do, but it doesn't, it's not that hard for me. And I've done it a lot for a lot of different video games. I think keeping it the sort of ambiguity and the um, intrigue with her, keeping everything a little open-ended so she has a mystery to her was, was something that we had talked about. Um, but you really, I mean, it's very specific how they direct you. With Each line is blocked off with a direction, and you work each line a bunch of times. So you don't quite flow of the whole story. I get that. Yeah. So when it came to this one, you were mentioning when I was you know, emailing you that there was some confusion when it came to this character because you voiced one of the trailers. <laughs> I think it was uh, Claudia Black voiced another trailer, and then you voiced her in the game. Was this was this intentional? They hadn't decided yet? Or? Oh, I have no idea. You know, it's like... Uh, we, I just I booked the trailer and I went in and I did it and I saw it and I was like oh that's cool, and then I start to see um, 
threads, you know, people going, is that Claudia Black? And I was like, wait a second. That's so, and then I, I didn't really know her work, and then I listened to her, and I'm like, oh, we do sound similar. And then I realized that she did a bunch of the other trailers, and I thought, oh, that, that's why everyone's confused. And then um, I was booked on to play the, the role. I don't know if she ever was in the game. Um, we don't really see each other. I mean, we don't see other actors. We just kind of come in and do our own thing, um, you know, singularly. So, But it was interesting that there was just so much uh, talk about it because I was like, wait a second, that was me in the trailer. And I'm like, oh, yeah, she did one too. <laughs> so it was confusing. <laughs> I think some of the confusion is she plays a fairly similar character in at least personality in Dragon Age, which Kings of Amalur is a similar type of game and a rival type game uh, for. Uh, and so they probably didn't want to cross those streams that much. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. It was interesting, but it, it was definitely a lot of, like, internet buzz. I was like, what is going on here? Who is this woman? But, and I was like, <laughs> oh, she has a cool voice. Okay. <laughs> the game is big as Kings of Amalur, which... Um, for me, I don't know, well over 100 hours playing. I know your character is not in it the whole time. She pops in whenever there's a certain type of story. Mm -hmm. but how long of a recording session or recording sessions does that, that that game take for just your character? I feel like we did two or three, and I think I was in New York, which was where I'm from originally at one point, and they actually recorded me there because they were needed to get some stuff done. There was a bit of a rush or, or just wanted to get it done, um, but I remember two or three sessions of it. And you work, you know, a chunk of time, maybe, maybe two sessions. And you just sit and kind of go through the whole game, go all your segments in the game. And then sometimes you do pickups, you know, if there's anything that they want to do after. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So James here is a big fan of uh, Guild Wars. Yeah. So I'm going to let him ask uh, his questions about Guild Wars okay. before I start launching this now. Wars. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because at that point, we're just, that's it. We're done. That's the whole conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but. I do have to say, though, to a fellow New Yorker, good to meet you. Yes, you too. Yeah, we're, I swear, we're all just transplanted into subtropical climates these days. Yeah, it's the warmth. It's the sun. We all want the sun. It has to be. But yeah. anyway, going on Guild Wars, though, you know, now, for those that don't know, you voiced uh, the narrator for Guild Wars. And Ooh. I was actually curious, is it a lot different to voice like say a narrator type of voice that style as opposed to actually creating a character like you did in kingdoms of amalur um i you know i think it's voiceover is interesting for me it's very intuitive you know i, I don't find it harder i mean i think the characters are harder because you have to go through more of an emotional you know journey or story a narrator a narration is it has sort of a, a different kind of feel to it um yeah, I, I, you know, I don't even know if they use my narration for Guild Wars. It's not, sometimes they book you on things and you do the job, and then they do, you know, a big game like Guild Wars. They might use somebody else. So, and I know I did some other smaller roles in that game. So I don't, I don't even remember how it all worked out. But it was one of those mm. things where I went in and did it, and then I think I heard someone else on the the thing I did, and I was like, oh, okay. But um, I like doing the narration. I think it's fun. I think it's interesting to that kind of storytelling. It's similar to the audiobooks and things that I do. Oh, well, there you go. I mean, that works out well. Yeah. But, you know, another thing, though, is, like, have with a game like that, though, like, you know, they always have, you know, sporadic updates and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Do they ever, like, call you back in and be like, hey, we're doing an update. We want you to come in and read for a few more lines or anything of that nature? Um, you know, with Star Wars, I've actually been, gone back in a bunch, and that's the first. Well, Doom 4, I went back in to do some pickups and some additional things. Um, but Star Wars, I've gone in a lot, almost like a regular, which is interesting that the storyline kind of keeps continuing and they find more Senya is continuing on, but it hasn't been written yet. So I've gone in for the last, you know, maybe you know, five months, once a month going in and working on that game, The Old Republic. And that's more rare to me. Um, my experience has been usually just kind of going one shot deal, but sometimes it's a recurring thing, you know, I guess it just depends on the kind of game it is. Well, Jerry, I do believe that was a segue into what you were going to ask, my friend. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to go into Star Wars stuff for a bit because, well, this is – it's November. Next month, a new Star Wars movie comes out. In two weeks, uh, Star Wars Battlefront comes out. Star Wars is kind of everywhere. The Old Republic just did its massive uh, release of Knights of the Fallen Empire, um, its second expansion of the year, I believe. And so there's a lot of Star Wars going on. And you voice uh, Senya. Mm -hmm. In uh, the Old Republic, you also do some voices in the the app uh, Star Wars Uprising. Yeah. Well, we'll start with uh, the Old Republic because that's the bigger. It's, it's a bigger game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, 
Just looking at the voice cast, basically every voice actor who they could possibly find <laughs> is in the game. Yeah, that's huge... the meat and potatoes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge game. And I think also once you get to know them, they're really nice people and the director is amazing. They, and you know, you kind of become, it's just like everything else. They want to use a certain actors again or a certain group of actors that you use more um, for, for, you know, games and you come back in and do more stuff. So I worked on Old Republic first and then they brought me in for um, Uprising too. So that was sort of how it worked. So you are Senya, who is of course in the game quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, how long ago were you first brought in to do voices? And you said they brought you back in for for re, you know for doing more voices and so on. Mm -hmm. Has the process evolved over time for how they've done this game since it's you know they've worked on it for years now? No, I think they always do. I mean, from what I understand, people go back in a lot, and once you get to know them, they use you a lot. You know, I auditioned and I got cast, and then I was surprised when I got brought back in, and I had been, and that was about I would say maybe six months ago, and I've gone back in four or five times since then just to continue with the character. And then I was brought in to um, Uprising to do something, too. Usually you go in and you do a main role, and then they ask you to do maybe sometimes a secondary role with a different kind of voice. And they just – because they can ask you to do, I think, three voices in one session. So sometimes they'll even use you to be a townsperson or somebody else. It doesn't sound too similar to your main character. Isn't that, like, the standard when it comes to doing uh, video games and shows? Like, they, when you sign you on, they can si they sign you on for up to three characters, and that's part of how you, how it's uh, set up with? Sometimes. Um, oftentimes for me, and I think it's different for women, um, because there's just not as many roles. I've only done my main role, and maybe, like, a villager. But I think probably for men, they get put onto a lot. They get used a lot more and do a lot more uh, soldiers and different kinds of things. I would think that. But, yes, they can. You know, that's what they can do. So sometimes they want people to variety if they, if they need it, and they can cast you for two or three roles at the same time. So when you were first brought in for, for Senya, first of all, did you know that you were working on a Star Wars title? Because I know sometimes when you work on games or shows, you have no idea what you're doing, and then you go in there and are like, oh, it's Star Wars. That's, um, that's what you know, I did, I did know. I did know. I think because it's an established um, project, there's no big secret. The ones that are, um, they give you them really weird titles that you're like, I don't know what I was working on, and then you realize months later what it was is because it hasn't been released yet, and they don't want anything leaked. So there's, um, that's usually when you sign disclosures and you don't, they have some sort of fake name for it. You really don't know what you're doing, <laughs> but this one I did. So I was excited to work on it, and I was like, I was happy to be brought back in. It was fun to to do that. So, what has the fan reaction been to you working in the the Old Republic, and especially Knights of the Fallen Empire, which is a pretty big and kind of drastic shift in this game, at least as far as DLC goes? Uh, you know. I don't know. You know, I, I don't, I'm not big on like my fan base or I'm really not good at that kind of stuff and I have to get better at it. Um, sometimes I'll just catch things on the internet and I'll go, oh, people are talking about me, but I don't really notice it. I don't really seek it out. Um, I'm hoping people are enjoying my work and, and I mean, my, my feeling is that they, they like my voice and, you know, um, it's good, it's good for the Queens. So she's a really strong woman and I like that. And she's dealing with, you know, her children who have kind of gone mad. So. It's interesting. I think the, the content is interesting to work on. Is it kind of a scary rabbit hole to go down to face this many Star Wars fans when... <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I actually really like talking to fans or to getting fan mail. Or I think it's really interesting to hear what people think. Because we, we work in such a small room that you don't... Like when I do theater, I mean, I... Know there are people out there listening, or when I do an audiobook in particular, I'm in a little tiny booth. You forget that there's thousands of people that are being touched by, you know, the story. And um, so I always think it's fun to kind of know that people are listening and interested. So I actually haven't gotten that much feedback on Star Wars. I don't know if a lot of it is out. I mean, I know there's some of it out already, but I'm in a yeah. Doom Four might get some um, <laughs> people talking because people are. It's only been what, a week with. Fallen Empire, so give, give us some time to play. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we know Bioware has a very particular style when they do recording, because we've we've talked to a lot of people from Bioware, Edmonton, Bioware, Austin. Mm -hmm. They have a very particular style of recording voices for games. Mm -hmm. um, so what? How has it been different, say, working with Kingdoms of Amalar versus working with Bioware for this one versus recording for Star Wars Uprising? What are some of the different styles? 
uh, of recording that you've seen when doing video games, especially? You know, I feel like there's a real standard. If it, sometimes they have a very good hands-on director, um, and they think it's important. And that's fun, I think, for us actors, because we get a lot of, um, you know, help and directing of how they want the, the lines read and and what's going on in the stories. And there's a lot of in back backstory and stuff given to you. Um, but often you just go in. They have it all on a screen now, and the lines are laid out. They tell you what they think the intention of the line is, and you do three takes of it. And if they get it, they capture it. And if they want to do more, they, you know, will redirect, and, and you kind of go line by line. It's challenging because you're not talking to anybody. It's not um, – you have nobody in the room with you doing dialogue. So you have to kind of feed yourself the line before and kind of get in a rhythm with it. So it's um, – I mean, that, that is a little challenging to me. So it sounds more naturalistic and not stilted. I know sometimes when it comes to animation, you'll have the recording sessions where you have everyone in the room together. Um, it, you know, Clone Wars, I know, did that. I think Rebels did that. Some of the shows have done that. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had an experience with a video games where they have everyone together, or is it always just uh, isolated? No, just I've always been isolated. I'm trying to think when I did an, I did an anime series called Blood Plus. I played uh, Julia on it. And we did people in the session together, which was fun because I think it's with animation, you, you tend to talk to each other more and it's, they do that. But with video games, it's very isolated. I'm, I'm, I'm not recalling any time I've been with anybody in a session. I've been by myself. So when it came to doing Star Wars Uprising, it being an app, and apps don't usually cost as, you know, they, they, well, they aren't expected to bring as much money as, say, the Old Republic, which was a $200 million game, and they chucked money at that thing. Mm -hmm. um, when you're recording for Star Wars Uprising, um, is is there any difference with how they read, how they do an app versus a, a full AAA title as far as recording, directing, time spent on it? Or is it more rushed? Is it more? No, uh, I think it's the same. I don't I don't see a difference. I think if there's a sort of a standard. I mean, sometimes the sessions are longer or shorter depending on if there's someone taking more time with the direction. But generally, if there's sort of a standard, they have you for I think it's four hours. Um, at one time. Sometimes you're used for the whole time, sometimes it's an hour, but I haven't noticed the standards being different for games, for different, you know, um, popularity of games or, or anything like that. So, Star Wars Uprising is a game which takes place in quote-unquote new Star Wars canon. Um, when you were recording for that game, I'm assuming, since Lucasfilm has done this with everything they've been doing since Star Wars was bought by Disney, that they put you on some pretty tight uh, restrictions on what you can and can't say, what you can and can't know. Uh, what, what, is this true for Star Wars Uprising, especially before it came out? Uh, yeah, I never know anything. I mean, I was, I was like, I hope you guys are asking me a lot of like story questions because really, we go in and we do, we barely get the scripts in advance. Um, you know, you're you're trusted as an actor to be really strong, and I think video games use a lot of theater actors because we're we're just we're adept, and um, you go into the session and you just on the fly have to build it all. There's not homework you get to do, or you don't really get a lot of preparation. They don't want the information out. So you basically arrive, get your script, go in the booth, and start recording. So you have to be good to get it done. So I have a fan question now. Okay. Um, shifting uh, a little bit, actually quite a bit. We talked about working in theater, mm -hmm. and this person says, you've done, you've done roles in a lot of big uh, theater productions. You know, Anthony and Cleopatra, you've done stuff in The Crucible. You've done stuff in Serrano de Bergerac. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, how has worked in theater um, helped you as a voiceover artist or doing things such as ADR? We got to work with Great Gatsby and so on. How has your work in theater affected your career otherwise? And how has your career in voiceover helped you as a theater actor? Uh, that's a great question. I think that um, theater actors are trained um, to to listen to the writing because theater is really about the writing um, as opposed to film and TV, which is about the sort of photography of it. Um, it's storytelling, but it's a different different way of storytelling. So when your ear is attuned to language, um, I think you just become more skilled at the musicality of language, how, how, how much energy you need. And I think in terms of doing a lot of Shakespeare or classical theater, it's a very heightened reality. Um, when you do video games, fantasy games, it's a very heightened reality. So that reality of the energy you need or being a king or a queen, if you've done a lot of theater, that's already sort of in your muscle system. 
it's not like someone who's done TV or sitcoms and they have to know how to use their, their, their voice. Actors are trained to use their voices, stage actors. So I think um, a lot of video games um, and audiobooks um, love to use theater actors because they're skilled with language, they know how to use it, and also um, they're trained. Their voices are trained. So your voice doesn't tire out. You know how to warm your voice up. And you also know the sort of height of the material. It comes easily to you. Okay, so here's another listener one. Uh, you mentioned how you were classically, you know, you're trained to do a theater acting, and that helps you with your voice. But a lot of video games are also very taxing on voices, as we've heard from other voice actors. You know, especially like Call of Duty games where they're screaming and shouting and mm-hmm. dying left and right. What they want to know, as far as animation or video games go, what has been the most taxing on your voice, and why? Um, I did a game. I, I can't. I don't remember the name of it right now, but it was the Brigamore Witch. And I created a voice for it that was very cool, but having to create that voice for two hours, I killed my voice. It was like a like a creaky, whispery, scratchy thing, and it was fine to do for the audition. But after uh, working for a whole session, it, like I lost my voice. And it's something I realized that you have to create a voice that you can sustain for that four hours and not hurt your voice. So that was hard. I think for men it's harder than women because we don't do the battle stuff and the screaming I mean, we do screaming. Sometimes we have to do you know, the physical stuff, but it's not half as much as the men. Um, sometimes the ADR work is taxing. You know, if you get a session where you're doing a lot of, like, screaming. I worked on Mad Max, um, and we did a lot of the, the, all the people in the pit, you know, kind of moaning and screaming. And, you know, it, it can get hard. You know, you just have to learn how to use your voice and rest it. And uh, I think if um, – you do theater, you, you you know how to save your voice, because when you do theater, you have to sustain on stage usually for a couple hours, too. So here's a, another listener one. They say, on Mama Radio, we've heard interviews with Belinda Cornish and Jennifer Hill and other voice actors who have mentioned how one challenge of doing female voices is doing your death scenes or battle noises, because it often sounds like porn. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you agree? And if so, how do you, this is from a female, how do you do voiceover work where you have to do those noises without it sounding like porn? I have never experienced it sounding like porn. That's it. Funny. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I've never even heard that. I, I, I've i never heard, felt like my battle cry sounded like porn. So I don't know. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't know. That was never. No, <laughs> that's right. You've heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> A voice actress who has never heard this theory before. <laughs> That's right. Bob you play the new Tomb Raider game and watch every time she dies. Oh, God, yeah. That's just, <laughs> oh, my uh, God. Now, now it'll so be in my wrong. head when I do it. I'll have to, I'll have to notify sound like that. I've never noticed. Oh, no, now we've ruined her. Oh, we've ruined her. We've absolutely <laughs> ruined her. Now, every time she does a death rattle, she's going to think, does it sound like porn? Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, moving on to uh, another part of your career, which you've done a lot of. You would mentioned how you've done a ton of audiobooks. Uh-huh. A lot of them uh, are on Audible, yeah. which is our sponsor. If you want to support us, go to audibletrial.com slash radio and get a free audiobook today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in fact, you and, get one read by Miss Abby Creighton. That's right. So when you're doing stuff with uh, audiobooks on Audible, uh-huh. uh, listeners want to know the process. We actually have uh, one of the people who – helped us on the show he actually does some audio of stuff with audible and he wants to know what is your process of recording audio books um how long is the sessions how, how much do you actually have to record in a sitting and how do they do quality control as far as audiobooks go okay well um at first when i first started doing audiobooks i worked for a lot of different companies like uh, random house and penguin and dion audio people that would bring me in to studios direct me i would do my work and I kind of learned working with directors, and then the business has changed where – and I always had a little voiceover booth for my voiceover career for my commercials and video game auditions. But I was um, – people were asking me to set up my own little home studio to be more available to do work from home because that's becoming more popular. And Audible was one of the companies, after I'd done about 40 audiobooks, um, that contacted me to work from home. So they basically send me scripts. I prepare them. I read them in advance prep them in terms of sort of character choices and words I don't know how to pronounce. I go in my booth, and I'm actually going to start a book when I get off this interview with you guys today. Um, and I, I do as much as I can. It's hard for me from home. I get very distracted easily. Um, and it's hard to, to be alone for that many hours. Um, so to me, a good day at home in my booth is four hours of recording, which is about two hours of an audiobook. 
So if it's an eight-hour book, it usually takes me probably four or five days I give myself. I could probably do it in half the amount of time, but it means that I'd have to sit in the booth for longer, and I have trouble doing that by myself. When I'm at a studio and someone's directing me and I'm there from nine to five, I can get it done much faster. But I tend to take lots of tea breaks and, you know, go to yoga in the middle of the day or something. So it's just different. It's a different process. And you really become um, – you have to learn. I had to learn pro tools. I had to learn how to self-direct myself. I had to learn how to punch myself in uh, the kind of punch and roll technique they use. And then I just send all my raw files out to Audible's editors. They audit it, uh, they edit it, and then they send me back pickups. I dr- drop the pickups in, and they take it all, and then they finish it off for me. I just kind of do the raw work. See, one thing I've noticed, because I, I, I do Audible and I go through that stuff, um, what, sometimes uh, the reviews, especially when it comes to Star Wars books, because that's what I get when Mark Thompson and other ones doing those ones, mm-hmm. um, the biggest thing that people gripe about is, this person mispronounced this name, this person mispronounced this, how could this person do this voice, blah, 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 blah. Um, how hard is it, among with the time that you're given, to get all these names right, get the feedback you need to get, make sure it's right the first time, and have you ever had a time where you've goofed up on a name and people uh, don't don't understand how hard it is um, it's really hard it's really hard when you're working with it like sometimes there are producers like Dion audio will do a word list and they'll check they have they hire people to check stuff especially if it's something that people know um, but still mistakes are made you know it's just it's very tricky I did a book um, called we are anonymous about the, the group anonymous and there was some very technical computer term that a, a computer person um, hacker type person would know, but no one else really would know. And I had read some feedback that they were like irritated that it was pronounced wrong, but like we do the best we can. We don't really, I think you're in a limited time frame sometimes. Sometimes you're by yourself and you're trying to do it all, but you do the best you can. And often I'll call the authors and I'll have a kind of conversations with authors and ask pronunciations. And that to me is the best. If I have questions, I try to get the publisher to contact the author and have a conversation with them. Um, but mistakes are made. You know, I think it's just it's a fa- it's become faster uh, to get the books out, and maybe less time is taken with that kind of stuff. Um, but I think people do the best they can. You know, everyone wants it to be good. We did a whole book, and I pronounced it wasn't really my responsibility, but because it was with someone who's directing me at a company, they pr- pronounced the whole last name of the, the character wrong, and the character's last name was on every page of the book, and we had to fix the entire book. It was crazy, you know. So and it was a fantasy book. It was it was crazy, you know. So the fantasy ones are hard because the names are strange. But if it's um, you know, it's a world like you know, you know, that's very very popular to people and very important that things are pronounced correctly. But to some of us out there, we don't know it. So, you know, I think you, you do the best you can. So I I know you do a lot of um, fantasy uh, novels. I which I believe does a lot of like witch hunt ones. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Do they seek you out because of your voice because it fits that, the, the fantasy premise? Or in some ways do you seek it out? Or does it just happen that way that you just happen to do a lot of vampire and witch and those type of – and werewolf, I guess, technically speaking. Well, um, um, and they, they seek you out. You're cast. It's like you're being cast in a role. And I think your voice quality um, – although I've done lots of different things. I've done young adult books. And I, my voice has a lot of variety to it, I think. But I, you're cast as sort of your general sound. So I do a lot of paranormal books. I do a lot of romance. Um, but I've also done some kids' books. I did a L. Frank Baum book, which was really fun, um, Sky Island, and I got to do lots of different character voices. And my 11-year-old son, who was like eight at the time, got to listen to an audio book, which was – he's into them. So usually he can't listen to mine because they're they're not really age-appropriate. So, But, um, yeah, you're cast for your voice type, and you kind of get in a, a niche, I think, with that. You know, Audible really cast me in a lot of romances. That's been sort of the, the things I've done for them. So when it when it comes to reading these books, you know I've I've read you know short stories and so on, and it takes a while to make sure I get everything right. How much practice do you give yourself to be able to just read through this and get it right, you know, the first or second time, and uh, or is it just something you've trained yourself to be able to read, you know, just read things and go through it really quickly that way? You know, it, it's a it's a kind of an interesting skill set. I think there really is no practice. You have to read the book, kind of know the story, get the, the feeling for it, make some character choices. Mark when the characters like are speaking so you don't trip up with that, but you basically just go. Um, sometimes you can stop and listen back and say, oh, that didn't sound right, or someone, if you have a director, they, they want you to do it differently. But it's really um, kind of a skill set of just 
in, intuitively and having experience and just doing it. You don't really get a lot of practice. They're, they're dense and they take a long time, so you don't really have time to fix and rehearse. Here's one that would work really well. I'm an aspiring voice actor, and I want to know where you'd recommend I focus. I've, got, I've done a job with Audible, and I've done a job with commercials, um, but sometimes I don't have time to do everything that I'd like to do. Is there a particular area of voice acting that you think is good for one to start with or at least focus on when it comes to voice acting? You know, I think audiobooks are a really great way to learn lots of different skills, and they're so – it's booming. It's a booming business right now, and they're recording everything, and it's gotten much cheaper. The digital downloads um, have become much cheaper to do. So there's just – everything's being recorded. But what I always recommend to people who are starting out – is to not work alone doing it because you don't have anyone teaching you. It's a skill set, and it's it's not that hard, but you do need to know how to do certain things. And if you start to work by yourself, um, you know, going on to ACX and booking titles, you can get in the habit of, of not helping yourself to kind of have a better longevity in the career and getting better books to do. So I think uh, making a demo or sending out your samples to all the companies that have directors where you can go into a studio how people work with you is always great. I mean, that's just how it started for me, and I worked with a lot of people and a lot of amazing uh, directors uh, as I was going along, and I learned how to then self-direct. But I think doing that at first is hard. Um, in terms of commercials uh, and video games, it's it's really getting a good agent. That's always the key because the agents have all the access to producers and the material, and it's very hard to do on your own. So getting a good voiceover agent, uh, sending your demo out or having someone drop it off, getting a personal um, touch, you know, with it is is really important. My career didn't really open up until I got a good voiceover agent, and then I booked a lot of commercials. Um, I did, you know, Diet Coke, McDonald's, and Toyota, I mean, just a ton. And then that shifted into video games, that shifted then into some anime, and then into audiobooks. Um, And all of it just sort of kind of fed each other. And then you, you, I mean, you, I think all of, all the people working in this business want to do everything because um, it's that's that's the business. You know, you want to be a voiceover actor, you want to do video games, animation, anime, commercials. It's all part of the same thing. Okay, there's one more fan question about uh, audiobooks. They said you've done a lot of romance novels, some of them supernatural romance novels. Mm-hmm. Have you ever read a book that halfway through or partway through you get? the feeling that this is rather awkward yes i have i have um i've done a lot of very um i wouldn't say pornographic but i would say uh sensual books and you know it at first it's kind of it's hard and a little bit embarrassing um and then after a while it's like anything else it's like you feel like it's it's like you're doing your laundry it's not a big deal i think you kind of it's just the job and you get past it sometimes Things are goofy, and I'll sort of stop, and I'll giggle, and I'll press, you know, start over again. But generally, it's just you just get used to it. It's just it's not a big deal. But at first, it can be awkward. Yeah. So last fan question: They want to know. A lot of voice actors can't listen to themselves. Are you able to actually listen to your own voices and do so without feeling terrible? Uh, yeah, I like listening to myself, not from like an ego place, but because I can correct things. Sometimes I'll listen and I'll go, especially with an audiobook, I'll think, oh, I was going too fast. You know, I wish I, I have to slow down. I have a fast tempo, and I have to really force myself to slow down sometimes. Um, or I think, oh, God, that character was not, that was just too much. You know, I think it's helpful. Um, it's harder for me to watch myself than to listen to myself. For me, um, my voice is its own kind of entity, I guess doesn't feel like it's, I don't know, my person. So even if I don't get a job or I'm criticized, it doesn't affect me as much as if I'm criticized live or in a film or TV or in theater. It feels more personal. So I I like listening to myself to kind of get better at what I do. Okay. So uh, before I start wrapping things up with my last few questions, uh, Ket, do you have any more, or James, I should say, do you have any more questions? You love using that name. Uh, no, actually, I'm pretty good, dude. I wanted to ask about Guild Wars, and I knew you were going to cover the rest. That's how you do. <laughs> You're the host of this here shindig. <laughs> okay, so I have three questions to wrap it up. The first one, this is uh, of you know great interest to me because I have uh, a little one, and I have another one on the way. 
is being a, a has being a mother um, enhanced your career as far as voice acting goes, and if so, how has it changed, refocused, or helped your 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 voices and your voice acting career, at least your decisions that you've made? I think my son was the biggest blessing for my voiceover career. I was pregnant and I couldn't travel to do theater anymore, and I had to really figure out how to earn money and. My voiceover career kind of exploded when I was pregnant. Um, I booked some national commercials, and I was able to be home with him, and money would just kind of come in. And it, it really, I mean, it was, it was a blessing. And then I think just being a, a, becoming a mother opens your heart up, and you just learn so much about life. And I think my voice matured also, um, which is kind of interesting. It deepened, and it kind of matured being a mother. And I was able to sort of age, age kind of gracefully with it. And I think it's, it's, it's huge and how it affected me and how it's enhanced my career. Yeah, it was, it was great. Okay, uh, so the next question is, is there a role or a voice or a line of your work that you never grow tired of talking about? You never, that you just, that you just love and because you're such a big fan of it, no matter how many times people talk to you, because I know sometimes you get asked the same questions over and over and over again, that you just are just, you just love talking about. <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, I just, I think that, I, no, not really, not really. I just, I think it's, it's fun that, that there are people listening out there because, as I mentioned before, we do everything in such a small space, um, a little booth or with one other person in the room or even sometimes people on Skype, you know, like this, and you – it's always sort of sometimes it's it's fun to imagine all the people out there listening and knowing that you're you're doing it for them you know especially if I'm doing an audio book and it's a long one I think you know I'm doing it for the people who want who who need this or want to listen to this or on their drive to work and it's enhancing their lives and that's that's a cool thing to be able to do that to give in that way I I enjoy that okay so now um, we're gonna do our final question that we always do and then it, if we could stay for just a little bit afterwards so we can record a bumper to help promote sure. and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the last question we ask is, uh, we're going to give you the soapbox so you can promote any upcoming appearances, upcoming work, um, your work on Audible, uh, your website, whatever you'd like to promote. We're going to give you the soapbox now to uh, promote yourself or talk to the fans. Okay, well, I'm, I'm really not into self-promotion, but um, um, I guess I'm, I'm excited about all the Star Wars games and uh, playing Olivia and the game Doom 4 that's coming up. Um, and that will be, I guess, released, I don't know, probably in a couple months. Um, I'm going to launch into a play in the spring in a theater company called The Noise Within, which is a really great classical company in Pasadena, California. Um, I'll be doing six characters in search of an author up here in Delo Peace, and I'm excited about that. I currently do a lot of voice uh, voices on the TV show Sleepy Hollow. I do ADR looping work on that. Sometimes you can hear witchy sounds or things like that. So I do work on that a lot. Um, and I recently won another earphone award for a book called The Precious One, which was really good novel. I've done a lot of books, some of them not so good, some of them amazing. Um, I'm really proud of uh, the books that I've done and I'm trying to think what else. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to... Um, you know, I don't have any appearances coming up soon, but I would love to do more animation. That's something that I would love to expand more into. And, um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you.